Would you please open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? This morning we're going to study verses 23 and 24, which is a prayer. And it's a conclusion of the second half of this letter. In 1 Thessalonians chapters 1 through 3, Paul concludes that section with a prayer. And then in chapters 4 and 5, Paul concludes this section with a prayer also. This prayer has two petitions and a promise. And it's wonderful good news, blessing, and encouragement for us. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Notice in verse 23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That's the first petition. And then it says, And may, here's your second petition, And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's two petitions, followed by a promise. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. To structure our study of these verses, we're going to cover three main points. Three main points as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. The first of those points is entitled, The Call to Holiness. The Call to Holiness. In verse 24 of our text, Paul tells us that God is the one who calls us. He who calls us is faithful. Now I ask you, to what Has God called us? To what has God called us? And the answer is that God has called us to holiness. God has called us to holiness. I'd like you to look with me back at chapter 4. Remember that this prayer is a conclusion of what Paul has been saying. And so we're going to look at a good portion of chapters 4 and 5 as context for verses 23 and 24 of chapter 5. Look at the beginning of chapter 4. There was a transition from chapter 3 into chapter 4 where Paul begins this, what we might call a practical section of the epistle. In light of who you are in Christ, you are to live in this way. And it is here that we see that holiness is what God has called us to. Paul says in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus... That as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. God's will for us is our sanctification. Now look at verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. God's will is our sanctification, and he has called us unto holiness. He has called us to sanctity. What does it mean for God to, for sanctification to be God's will, or for God to call us to holiness? Well, it means precisely what Paul said, that we are to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. We are to, to do more and more what the apostles instructed to live in holiness. And of course, chapter 4 and 5 have been telling us how to live in holiness. So if God's will is our sanctification, that means God wants us and commands us to live in holiness, which means he has called us to holiness. The call to holiness means we must obey God's will. We must put sin to death. We must refuse to participate in in evil. We must live in light of his law and walk in the calling of his holiness. And so when we consider the call to holiness, we can see God's will that we 
live in a holy manner, but we can also see God's warning. He has called us to holiness, and there is a warning if we do not heed that call. Look at chapter 5 with me, and the first seven verses, a good portion. Before we read that, let, let me preface it. What have I said in many of my sermons about 1 Thessalonians? Paul wants the Thessalonians to live in the real world. In other words, Paul wants the Thessalonians to recognize and remember Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. Jesus Christ is going to return from heaven. And Paul is saying, you need to live in holiness. You need to walk in holiness to which you have been called until he returns. And now here's the warning, the or else. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, Christ's second coming, will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So there are certain people who are unprepared for this. Verse 4, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. What is Paul saying? What are the metaphors of darkness and night and drunkenness as opposed to light and day and sobriety? Paul is saying that when Jesus returns, he will return to save his people. Who are his people? The children of the day, the children of the light, who walk in sobriety, who walk in holiness. But those who walk in unholiness, those who live in sin, those who are the children of the night and of the darkness, God will come to destroy them. Jesus will come to destroy them. And he says they will by no means escape. So we have been called to holiness, and we know that is God's will, but we also see God's warning. That if we do not walk in the way of holiness, we prove ourselves to be children of darkness. We prove ourselves not to be God's children, and we will be destroyed at his appearing. We will be destroyed at his coming if we live in sin. The call to holiness is absolute. We must be faithful unto God. We must live in holiness unto God. It is both his will and his warning to us. This is the context for Paul's prayer. And it brings us to our second main point. Having looked at the call to holiness, now we come to the covenant of holiness. The covenant of holiness. When the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, what work were they given to do? One of the main things that they were tasked with was making bricks. They made bricks to build cities and storehouses for the Egyptian lords, for Pharaoh and the taskmasters over them. And for a time, they were given straw as fuel to burn the fires in which the bricks would be made. They, their ovens needed fuel. The straw was the fuel to make the bricks in the ovens. And then Pharaoh decided, tell the taskmasters, no longer shall you give them straw, but you shall demand the same amount of bricks from them. They must find their own straw. They must find their own fuel to light the fires to make the bricks in the oven. And the Israelites groaned and they said, how can we keep up the same output when we have a whole other job added of collecting straw, collecting fuel for the fires to make the bricks? So they had a duty to produce something, but they had no power to do it. They had no fuel to do so. Brothers and sisters, the wonderful good news of Paul's prayer here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, is that the God who has called us to holiness has also covenanted holiness to us. The God who called us to holiness has also covenanted holiness to us. Would you please consider with me three points under this heading? As we walk in this path of holiness, holiness we're not alone. The first thing I'd like you to consider, number one, is that God is gracious. <clears throat> God is gracious. Paul 
Paul is saying, now may the God who has called you to holiness and in which you must walk, may he sanctify you completely. May he enable you to live a holy life. May God himself help you to do and enable you to do and strengthen you to do those things unto which he has called you. We find that God is gracious because look back at chapter 4. He gives us what we need to obey his call. Chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. Paul says, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And then he says, Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. The one who has called us to holiness gives us the Holy Spirit to help us live in holiness. This is God being gracious to us. The Egyptian taskmasters say, make the bricks and find the straw. We will not help you at all. God comes to us and he does not give us a burden to carry and demand you must produce, you must produce. Here is the burden which I give unto you. My yoke is heavy, but you will bear it. No, no. God gives us a wonderful law in which the heart of man ought to delight. He gives us a beautiful thing to obedience. He gives us a wonderful thing, holiness. He says, produce holiness. And then he graciously gives us his Holy Spirit to enable us to be holy. If you'd like to turn here, you're more than welcome to Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 to 27 Think with me for a moment about God's covenant promises to his people. Think about Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. In Jeremiah 31, God says, I will put my spirit in them. I will write my law on their hearts. And so God is promising, I will help them obey. I will put my law within them and I will give them my Holy Spirit. And I love the way that Ezekiel expresses, that in, expresses this in chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. God says to us through the prophet Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. This is what we call regeneration or the new birth. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Not only does he give us a new nature, regeneration, being born again, verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The Lord our God in covenant not only does he justify us, not only does he say, I will forgive your sins, I will remember them no more. He also says, and I will sanctify you. I will give you a new heart. I will write my law within you. I will give you my Holy Spirit, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will cause you to be careful to obey my rules. So the one who has called us to holiness has also covenanted holiness to us because he is gracious, gracious to forgive us, gracious to empower us and strengthen us and enable us to obey him and serve him. He will cause us to walk. He will cause us to be careful to obey. What a contrast with those Egyptian taskmasters. Produce, but we will give you nothing, no power, no help. The second thing I'd like you to consider, first, God is gracious. Second, God is able. God is able. Here we're considering God's power, his, his omnipotence, his omnipotence, his all-powerfulness. God is able to work in us. He is able to, he is able to enable us. Would you please turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. As you're turning there to Philippians chapter 2, we need to be clear about something. When we say that God sanctifies us, 
When we say that God causes things in us, we need to understand that that means that God enables us to do these things. God makes us able to resist temptation, and he makes us able to pursue and cultivate and grow in holiness. Sanctification, brothers and sisters, this is very important, sanctification is not a magic carpet ride. Sanctification is not, okay, get on the sanctification magic carpet, and off you go unto holiness. No, sanctification is God strengthens us so that when temptation comes, we are able to say no. And when holiness, not comes, but we are able to grow in holiness and cultivate it and progress in holiness. He enables us to do this with his power. There is, there is a danger that we face in churches that teach what is commonly known as, as Calvinism or monergism, where people think that sanctification is, well, either God does it or I do it. And the Bible says God sanctifies us, so I guess I don't do it. But the truth is that God, by his sanctifi- sanctifying power, enables us to do it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, here's the, here's the command of production. Work out your own salvation. Build, build the bricks. Or not build the bricks, but make the bricks. But what does he say? Chapter 13, or not chapter 13, verse 13. For, because... It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He makes us want to do it, and he enables us to do it. But who is the one obeying? It's you and me. God doesn't, God doesn't puppet string make me obey. Wow, look at me being sanctified. I'm doing the holiness that I, didn't, I don't even know what I'm doing, but God's doing it in me. No, we are the ones who must say no to to unholiness. We are the ones who must say yes to holiness. And it is God who works in us. It is because he is able that we are able to live in holiness and able to press on in the fight. So when Paul says, "Now Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, We don't just sit there in the sanctification shower. Oh, I'm getting holier. I'm getting holier. No, it is in temptation when you say no to sin. That is when God has worked in you to sanctify you. But you have to say no. You have to fight against the sin. You have to press on and persevere because God is able. For it is he who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. But will that be enough? Will will that be enough? I don't think I'm going to make it. Listen to Jude, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and who is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. What does Jude tell us? He declares praise to God by saying that God is able to keep us from stumbling, able to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So the God who works in us as we fight against sin is able to help us win the war all the way to the end. Will we win every battle? Will we have a perfect record? Will our Wins and losses be 100 wins and zero losses? No, it won't be a perfect record, but it will be a winning record. He will preserve us to the end. He is able to keep us from stumbling. We may stumble, but he keeps us from stumbling fully or finally. He restores his children. He brings them back. He is able. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. May he enable you to walk in holiness and keep you from falling away from that holiness. Brethren, we are able because he enables us. We are able because he 
is able. God has called us to holiness. It is his will, and we have seen his warning. God has covenanted holiness to us because he is gracious. He gives us everything we need. He is able. What he has given to us is sufficient to take us all the way, which leads us to the third subpoint under this heading. Thirdly, God is faithful. God is faithful. What a wonderful comfort that our gracious and powerful God is also faithful. Will he do it? Yes, absolutely. Paul tells us he will surely do it. He will surely do it. I said earlier at the beginning that chapters 1 through 3 conclude with a prayer and chapters 4 and 5 conclude with a prayer. It's very interesting that these two prayers are actually very similar. They more or less pray for the same thing. And I want you to look back at chapter 3 to read the first prayer that Paul offered on their behalf, on on behalf of the Thessalonians, and see what Paul says about what God will do for them. At the end of chapter 5, he says, He is faithful. He's faithful to do this. 1 Thessalonians 3 reassures reassures us of this. Verses 11 to 13. Now, just like chapter 5, now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And here you go, verse 12 and 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. He will establish our hearts blameless in holiness. I want my heart to be established blameless in holiness. Do you want your heart to be established blameless in holiness? He says he will do this. He will do this, and he who has called us to this He who has equipped us for this, he is faithful to do it. He is gracious to forgive us. He is able to preserve us. He is faithful to save us. But will I make it? Will I get there? Jump back to chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 and 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. What has God destined us for? To obtain salvation, to arrive at salvation. He has destined us to make it all the way. He is faithful. He will do it. And so Paul's prayer that God would sanctify us completely at the coming of our Lord Jesus is in the context of all of these verses that have come before. That may the Lord establish your hearts. The will of God is your sanctification. He has called us to holiness. He has warned us that we we ought not to be the children of the night but of the day. And that when Jesus comes, we have been destined to obtain salvation at his coming. We've not been destined for wrath. Now may God, now now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May he bring to completion all of this wonderful work which he has begun in you and which he has promised to complete. Brothers and sisters, Christ will return to save us all, to bring to consummation the salvation that he won for us. And he will preserve us until that time. He will return to finish the work that he began. He will establish our hearts. He who calls us, he who destined us, is faithful. He will surely do it. Brother or sister, do you believe this? Do you believe that he is faithful? Do you believe that he will surely do it? Do you believe that he will establish your heart blameless in his holiness? Do you believe that he will preserve you to the end? Delight in that. Delight in that. Rejoice in that. Rest in that. He is gracious. He is able. He is faithful. 
He enables us to fight sin and to pursue holiness. God has called us to holiness. We must walk in that. He has covenanted holiness to us, and he is gracious and able and faithful to preserve us in that calling. This brings us to our third and final point. Thirdly, the completion of holiness. The completion of holiness. Paul uses emphatic language with regard to completion. In his prayer, he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the language of completion. May he sanctify you completely, and may all that you are, your whole spirit, soul, and body, all that you are, may God preserve you blameless. Just as he said, may he establish your hearts blameless in chapter 3 at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is clearly emphasizing is that God himself will preserve all that we are in every way unto the very end. Now, spirit and soul here very likely refer to man's mental and emotional life. We have to remember that the things that we think and the things that we feel, there are sins in these things, as well as sins of the body. And so Paul is saying, may your thoughts be pure, May your affections be pure. May your actions be pure. So that when Christ returns, he greets you as his child, a child of the day, as one of his sheep. May the God of peace himself guard you and keep you in that holiness until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who called you to that is faithful to to bring you to it. He will certainly do it. Paul is praying for complete sanctification. Sanctification of what we feel. Sanctification of what we think. Sanctification of what we do. Because he wants the Thessalonians to realize you have to give yourself fully to the Lord. You need to live in holiness in every possible way unto Christ. Dedicate yourselves unto him. Praying that God would enable them to do this. Praying that the God of peace himself would enable them to live in this calling. Now what I want us to recognize here is that at Jesus' coming, when he returns, the sanctification of the living and the dead, of his living and his dead, his precious saints, their sanctification will be completed in an instant. Would you please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? First Corinthians 15, look at verses 51 to 57. Paul is talking about the return of Jesus Christ. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery means something that is being made known to you, but it's being made known to you in a, a, partial, a partial way, in a way that we cannot fully comprehend because it's ahead of us, because it's beyond what anything that we have seen or experienced. So mystery does not mean we're not sure what it is. It means it's beyond even the words that are being used to describe it. Mystery is not a way of hiding something from you. It's a mystery. It's a way of telling you something. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when will this happen, Paul? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound... And the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When will the trumpet sound? When Christ returns. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is especially concerned with the resurrection of the body. That's his focus there. And he says that we will be changed. We will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. You blink, and it's, it's happened. That's the twinkling of an eye. In the time it takes to close the eye and open it, that is how fast the transformation will be instantaneously completed. Paul speaks of the trumpet of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And so, we, his people, what should we expect to happen when Jesus returns? We should expect that when he returns, he will bring our sanctification to its full conclusion. Do you think it's just our bodies that will be transformed in that moment? Do you think it's just our bodies that will become immortal? Do you think that a defiled, sinful soul would be in an incorruptible and glorious body? Of course not. God will bring to completion the sanctification of the whole man, your heart, your, your spirit, soul, and body, all that you are. The completion of sanctification will occur when Christ returns. Those who die in the Lord now their souls are sanctified completely at death. But we're speaking of those who will be alive at his return. And that is our concern. Our concern is because the Lord may return at any time, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared ourselves. We don't worry about the dead. They are taken care of. We need to worry about ourselves. We need to be watchful, waiting for the Lord's return. As Paul said in chapter 5, which will come like a thief in the night, suddenly, but we won't be taken by surprise because we want to greet him as his holy people whose holiness he will bring to completion when he returns in the twinkling of an eye. And we will be transformed, not just our bodies, but our souls, the material and the immaterial part of man. And brethren, he is gracious. He is able. He is faithful. He will surely do it. He will sanctify you completely in that final lifting up. Let me ask you this. Do you long for that day, the completion of your sanctification? He is faithful. He will surely do it. Do you have a sanctified impatience for that day? We will partake of the Lord's Supper. What do we say when we partake of it? We say that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We don't want to keep celebrating the Lord's Supper. We want to be with the Lord. We want to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb, not the rehearsal supper. We want to be with him. And when he returns, he will sanctify us completely in every way. And so he will preserve us unto that time by his power as we persevere with his power. And then when he returns, he will instantaneously, completely, finally, fully, and eternally perfect us with the conclusion and completion of our holiness. He is faithful. He will surely do it. it. It makes us say with John at the end of Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Please, please, oh Lord, come and complete my sanctification. But brothers, you must understand that until that time, he's given you everything that you need. He has called you to holiness, but he has also covenanted holiness to you. And Paul's prayer is all about this. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May he enable you to walk in holiness in every way. And on that path, when he returns, may he sanctify all that you are at his coming. And the one who has called you to this, the one who has covenanted it to you, he will surely do it because he is faithful. Well, let's draw three applications from this text. 
having considered the call to holiness, the covenant of holiness, and having looked at the way in which the Lord our God will complete our holiness, how can we apply this? Three things. First, let no sinner despair. Let no sinner despair. Perhaps you listen to this and you, you say, I am unholy. I am unrighteous. I, I acknowledge I'm a child of the night. I'm a child of the darkness. I love myself. I love the things of this world, and I live in them. I, I admit it. So Jesus is going to come to destroy me. Jesus is going to come to judge me, to raise me up unto everlasting destruction. That's hopeless. Yes, the end is hopeless, but it's not the end. Jesus came the first time to bring salvation to all those who ask him for it. And God is gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love. He forgives sins in Jesus Christ. Those who find themselves wicked and sinful need not despair. They ought not to despair. Who are those who receive mercy from God? All those who ask it. All those who ask for mercy from God in Jesus Christ will receive it. They will not be cast out. They will not be pushed away. Let no sinner despair. Yes, but the depth of the darkness and the depravity of my heart, you don't understand. God knows. God knows better than you do. Let no sinner despair. Jesus will return to save his people. You can become one of his people by trusting in, his, in, in himself, in Jesus, and being baptized in his name and incorporated into his church and living in this calling of holiness unto which he has called all his people. Rest in him. Trust in him. Do not despair. He delays, not as men delay, because... They're waiting for something. He delays on purpose because he has appointed a time to return, and his delay is called patience. And his patience is called salvation. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Children, spouses, friends, visitors, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Plead with the, not plead, but ask. Ask the Lord for forgiveness in his name. And you will have it. You will be saved. You will be saved from that wrath to come. Secondly, let no saint despair. Let no saint despair. The warning is not just for the wicked. It is for the saints. We must show ourselves to be God's people. If we continue to walk in darkness, the children of God step in darkness, but if we press on in darkness, if we walk in darkness, if we make that our path, we show ourselves to be children of the night. And so perhaps you, as a saint, despair and say, I have walked so far in sin. I have gone so far against my Lord. I have been so unfaithful to him. I... I the pit that I have dug is too deep. The road I have trodden is, is too far. The sin I have committed is too great. Let no saint despair. He has promised to forgive our sins, and he has promised to give us his Holy Spirit and to make us able and willing to obey him. So those who name the name of the Lord and walk in sin and will not be restored, it's because they don't believe. They don't believe that God will forgive. They don't believe that God will help them, which means they're not his children. Let no saint despair. Let no saint despair. God has promised, and he who promised is faithful. If he is faithful, then every saint can be strengthened. Every saint can be reinforced 
and fortified to press on in his strength. It is because he is able that I am able. It is because he has promised. It is because he is faithful. It is because he is gracious. It is because it is he who works in me that I can fight against sin and I can emerge from this darkness and I can walk back on this path and I can be restored and I can throw myself on his throne of grace knowing that he will receive me. When we read from 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul tells us the wonderful news of the instantaneous sanctification of the body, which also will be the time of the sanctification of the soul, what is Paul's conclusion? He says in the next verse, which we did not read in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul calls the Corinthians to holiness in light of that wondrous future that God has prepared for us, in light of the resurrection, in light of the sanctification of the soul and the body. Therefore, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Sanctification is not a magic carpet ride. If you're on a boat and someone says, God, has destined you to arrive at this port, would you say, okay, turn off the motor or stop rowing the boat because God has destined us to make it to this port? No, you'd say, because God has destined us to make it to that port, full speed ahead, man the oars, let's go because he's guaranteed we're going to get there. We have every reason, every motivation, everything we need to go all the way with the confidence and the trust and the faith that he has destined us for this. So also, brethren, as God has called us to holiness and destined us to obtain salvation at his coming, so he has commanded us to be faithful unto that time. And he has covenanted faithfulness to us. He has covenanted holiness to us. He's given us everything we need, so let no saint despair. Let no saint despair. Those who despair and walk away do not believe that he is faithful. Let, not, let that not be us. Let that not be us. The Lord has given us everything we need. And we could, we could even add a sub-point here and, and say, in this pilgrimage, we're not alone. Not only has he given us his law, a new nature, and the Holy Spirit, he's given us each other. He's given us the church. He's given us a structure of authority and accountability in the church. And he's given us accountability with one another. What has Paul been saying for chapters 4 and 5? He's been giving plural commands to the people. And you, brethren, all of you, admonish the disorderly. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. Paul has been saying, you all, help yourself, not help yourselves, but help each other in this call to holiness. Help each other as we persevere and strive on towards the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he prays for God's sanctifying power to enable them to do this. God has given us everything we need. The saint must remember, I have everything provided for me, and I have a good, gracious, powerful, and faithful God. I will do that which is right Whatever the cost to me, if, if the, the depth of my sins means it costs me to get out of it, it hurts me to get out of it, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And if you will not, you are not one of me. If you set your hand to the plow and then you turn back, you are not one of mine. Let no saint despair, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Thirdly and lastly, let us all praise and thank God. Let us all praise and thank God for his grace, his power, and his faithfulness. Let us all praise and thank God for his power, his grace, his power, and his faithfulness. Brethren, the Lord has given us a high and holy calling. But he has given us everything we need and his promises, his covenant, his assurances that he will help us to get there. When we arrive, 
at the end, at the completion of our holiness. We're not going to be Rocky Balboa. (laughs) We're not going to say, look at me, I did it. (laughs) Yes. No, we're going to say, oh Lord, it is only by your grace. Oh Lord, it is only by your power. Oh Lord, it is only by your faithfulness that we have made it here. Just like the Israelites, when they crossed into the promised land, they, they reflected on their history and they said, he smote Pharaoh, he smote the Egyptians, he parted the Red Sea, he gave, gave us the manna, he gave us the quail, he gave us the water in the wilderness, he caused our garments not to wear out, he caused our sandals not to wear thin, he protected us all the way, he fought for our enemies, he drove them out with hornets, he did everything. So also we, when we arrive at that heavenly home, when we arrive at that heavenly Canaan, that promised land, in the completion of our sanctification, we will say all glory, praise, and thanks be to God for his grace and his power and his faithfulness. But I encourage you to start singing that now. (laughs) I encourage you to start saying that now and to fill your hearts with praise and thanks to God for his grace and his power and his faithfulness to us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, We long to be where Jesus is, and we long to be with him. But we thank you that he is with us by his Holy Spirit. And we thank you that you have given us your holy law. We thank you that your commands are not burdensome. We thank you that you have given us a new nature. We thank you that you have caused us to be born again. We thank you that you have put your Holy Spirit within us, who jealously yearns for us, who contends for us, who will not give us up. How we thank you for your covenant to us in Christ Jesus. We pray that you would help us, enable us, O Lord, sanctify us, so that we might fight against sin and resist temptation and grow in holiness, abound in goodness. We ask for your help in this because we need you, O Lord our God. We need your grace, we need your power, we need your faithfulness. We ask it of you knowing that you will grant it to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.